Game of Thrones, Book 1 of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. This is Bran's second point of view chapter. The hunt left at dawn. The king wanted a wild boar at the feast tonight. Prince Joffrey rode with his father, so Rob had been allowed to join the hunters as well. Uncle Benjen, Jory, Theon Greyjoy, Sir Roderick, and even the queen's funny little brother had all ridden out with them. It was the last hunt, after all. On the morrow, they left for the south. Bran had been left behind with John and the girls and Rickon, but Rickon was only a baby, and the girls were only girls, and John and his wolf were nowhere to be found. Bran did not look for him very hard. He thought John was angry at him. John seemed to be angry at everyone these days. Bran did not know why. He was going with Uncle Ben to the Wall to join the Night's Watch, but that was almost as good as going south with the king. Rob was the one they were leaving behind, not John. For days, Bran could scarcely wait to be off. He was going to ride to the King's Road on a horse of his own. Not a pony, but a real horse. His father would be hand of the King, and they were going to live in a real castle at King's Landing. The castle the Dragon Lords built. Old Nan said there were ghosts there. The dungeons were terrible things had been done, and dragon heads on the walls. It gave Bran a shiver just to think of it. But he was not afraid. How could he be afraid? His father would be with him, and the king would with all his knight and sworn swords. Bran was going to be a knight himself some day, one of the king's guard. Old Nan said they were the finest swords in all the realm. There were only seven of them, and they wore white armor and no wives or children, but lived only to serve the king. Bran knew all the stories. Their names were like music to him. Sirwin of the Mirror Shield, Sir Ryan Redwine, Prince Almond of the Dragon Knight, the twins Sir Eric and Sir Arik, who had died on one another's swords hundreds of years ago, when brother fought sister in the war of singers called the Dance of the Dragons, the White Bull, Jared Hightower and Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, Barristan the Bold. Two of the Kingsguard had come north to King Robber. Bran had watched them with fascination, never quite daring to speak to them. Sir Burroughs was a bald man with a jolly face, and Sir Marin had droopy eyes and a beard that color of rust. Sir Jamie Lannister looked more like a knight's in the stories, and he was of the Kingsguard too, but Rob said he had killed the old mad king and shouldn't count any more. The greatest living knights were Sir Barristan Selmy, Barristan the Bold, and Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Father had promised that they would meet Sir Barristan when they reached King's Landing, and Bran had been marking the days on his wall, eager to depart, to see the world he had only dreamed of and begin a life he could scarcely imagine. Yet now, that was the last day at hand, suddenly Bran felt lost. Wonderful had been the only home he had ever known. His father had told him that he ought to say his farewells today, and he tried. After the hunters had ridden out, he wandered through the castle with his wolf at his side, intending to visit the ones he would leave behind. Old Nan, the gauge, the cook, Micken and his smithy, Hodor, the stable boy who smiled so much and took care of his pony and never said anything but Hodor, the man in the glass gardens who gave him a blackberry when he came to visit. But it was no good. He had gone to the stable first and seen his pony there in the stall, except it wasn't his pony anymore. He was getting a real horse and leaving the pony behind, and all of a sudden Bran just wanted to sit down and cry. He turned and ran off before Hodor and the other stable boys could see the tears in his eyes. That was the end of his farewells. Instead, Bran spent the morning alone in the godswood, trying to teach his wolf to fetch a stick, and failing. The wolfling was smarter than any of the other hounds in his father's kennel, and Bran would have a sworn he understood every word he had said to him, but he showed very little interest in chasing sticks. He was still trying to decide on a name. Rop was calling his Grey Wind because he ran so fast. Sansa named hers Lady, and Arya named hers after some old witch king in the songs, and little Rickon called his Shaggy Dog which Bran thought was a pretty stupid name for a dire wolf. John's wolf, the white one, was Ghost. Bran had wished he had thought of that first, even though his wolf wasn't white. He had tried a hundred names in the last fortnight, but none of them sounded right. 
Finally, he got tired of the stick game and decided to go climbing. He hadn't been up on the broken tower for weeks with everything that has happened, and this might be his last chance. He raced across the godswood, taking the long way around to avoid the pool where the heart tree grew. The heart tree had always frightened him. Trees ought not have eyes, Bran thought, or leaves that look like hands. His wolf came sprinting at his heels. You stay here, he told him at the base of the sentinel tree near the armory. Lie down, that's right, now stay. The wolf did as he was told. Bran scratched him behind the ears, then turned away. Jumped, grabbed a low branch, and pulled himself up. He was halfway up the tree, moving easily from limb to limb when the wolf got to his feet and began to howl. Bran looked back down. His wolf fell silent, staring up at him through the slitted yellow eyes, and strange chill went through him. He began to climb again. Once more the wolf howled. Quiet, he yelled. Sit down. Stay. You're worse than mother. The howling chased him all the way up the tree until finally he jumped off onto the armory roof and out of sight. The rooftops of Winterfell were Bran's second home. His mother often said that Bran could climb before he could walk. Bran could not remember when he first learned to walk, but he could not remember he started to climb either, so he supposed it must be true. To a boy, Winterfell was a gray stone labyrinth of walls and towers and courtyards and tunnels spreading out in all directions. In the older parts of the castle, the the hall slanted up and down so that you could even be sure what floor you were on. The place had grown over the centuries like some monstrous stone tree. Mr. Lewin told him once that the branches were gnarled and thick and th its roots sunk beneath the earth. When he got out from underneath it, he scrambled up near the sky. Bran could see all of Winterfell in a glance. He liked the way it looked, spread out beneath him, only birds wheeling over his head while the life of the castle went on below. Bran could perch for hours among the shapeless, rain-worn gargoyles that brooded over the first keep. Watching it all, the men drilling with the wood and the steel in the yard, the cooks tending their vegetables in the glass garden, restless dogs running back and forth in the kennels, the silence of the godswoods and the girls gossiping beside the washing well. It made him feel like he was lord of the castle, in a way even Rob would never know. It taught him Winterfell's secrets, too. The builders had not even leveled the earth. There were hills and valleys behind the walls of Winterfell. There was a covered bridge that went from the fourth floor of the bell tower across to the second floor of the rockery. Bran knew about that, and he knew you could get inside the inner wall by the south gate climbed three floors, and ran all the way around Winterfell through a narrow tunnel in the stone, and then come out on ground level at the north gate, with a hundred feet of wall looming over you. Even Maester Lewin didn't know that, Bran was convinced. His mother was terrified that one day Bran would slip and fall and kill himself. He told her that he wouldn't, but she never believed him. Once she made him promise that he would stay on the ground. He had managed to keep that promise for almost a fortnight miserable every day until one night he had gone out the window of his bedroom when his brothers were fast asleep he confessed the crime the next day in a fit of guilt lord edward ordered him to the godswood to cleanse him guards were posted to see that bran remained there alone all night until to reflect on his disobedience the next morning bran was nowhere to be seen they finally found him fast asleep in the upper branches of the tallest sentinel in the grove as angry as he was, his father could not help but laugh. You're not my son, he told Bran when they fetched him down. You're a squirrel. So be it. If you must climb, then climb, but try not to let your mother see you. Bran did his best, although he did not think he ever really fooled her, since his father would not forbid it. She turned to others. Old Nan told him a story of a bad little boy who climbed too high and was, who was struck down by lightning, and how afterward the crows came to peck out his eyes. Bran was not impressed. There were crow's nests atop the broken tower where no one ever went but him, and sometimes he filled his pockets with corn before he climbed up, and the crows ate it right out of his hand. None of them had never shown the slightest bit of interest in pecking out his eyes. Later, Mr. Lewin built a little pottery boy and dressed him in Bran's clothes and flung it off the wall into the yard below to demonstrate what would happen if Bran fell. That had been fun, but afterward, Bran just looked at the maester and said, I'm not made of clay, and anyhow, I never fall. Then, for a while, the guards would chase him whenever they saw him on the roofs and try to haul him down. 
That was the best time after all. It was like playing a game with his brothers, except Bran always won. None of the guards could climb half as well as Bran, not even Jory. Most of the time they never saw him anyways. People never look up. That was another thing he liked about climbing. It was almost like being invisible. He liked how it felt, pulling himself up on the wall stone by stone, finger and toes digging into the small crevices between. He always took off his boots and went barefoot when he climbed. It made him feel as if he had four hands instead of two. He liked the deep, sweet ache it left on his muscles afterwards. He liked the way the air tasted way up high, sweet and cold as the winter peach. He liked the birds, the crows, and the broken tower, the tiny little sparrows that nested in cracks between the stones, and the ancient owls who slept in dusty loft above the old armory. Bran knew them all. Most of all, he liked going places that no one else could go, and seeing the gray sprawl of Winterfell in the way that no one else ever saw it. It made the whole castle Bran's secret place. His favorite haunt was the broken tower, once it was a watchtower, the tallest tower in Winterfell. A long time ago, a hundred years before even his father had been born, a lightning strike had set it on fire. The top third of the structure had collapsed in on itself, and the tower had never been rebuilt. Sometimes his father sent ratters into the base of the tower to clean the nests out. They always found among the jumble of fallen stones and charred, rotten beams. But no one ever got to the jagged top of the structure now except for Bran and the crows. He knew two ways to get there. You could climb straight up the side tower itself, but the stones were loose and the mortar that held it together long gone to ash. Bran never liked to put his full weight on them. The best way was to start from the gods' woods, skinny up the tower sentinel and cross to the armory, and then guards hall, leaping roof to roof barefoot so all the guards wouldn't hear you overhead. That brought you up to the blind side of the first keep, the oldest part of the castle, a squat round fortress that was taller than it looked. Only rats and spiders lived in there now, and the old stones still made for good climbing. You could go straight up to where the gargoyles leered out blindly over empty space, and swing from gargoyle to gargoyle, hand over hand, around to the north side. From there, if you really stretched, you could reach out and pull yourself to the broken tower where it leaned close. The last part was the scramble up the blackened stones to the eyrie. No more than ten feet and the crows would come out and see if you were brought any corn. Bran was moving from gargoyle to gargoyle when ease of the long practice when he heard voices. He was so startled he almost lost his grip. The first keep had been empty all his life. I do not like it, a woman was saying. There was a row of windows beneath him, and the voice was coming out of the last window on this side. You should be the hand. Gods forbid, a man's voice replied lastly. It's not an honor I'd want. That's far too much work involved. Brian hung, listening, suddenly afraid to go on. They might glimpse his feet if he tried to swing by. Don't you see the danger this puts us in? The woman said. Robert loves the man like a brother. Robert can barely stomach his brothers. Not that I blame him. Stannis would be enough to give anyone indigestion. Don't play the fool. Stannis and Rinley are one thing, and Eddard Stark is quite another. Robert will listen to Stark. Damn them both. I should have insisted that he name you, but I was certain Stark would refuse him. We ought to count ourselves fortunate, the man said. The king might as easily have named one of his brothers, or even Littlefinger. Gods help us. Give me honorable enemies and ambitious ones, and I'll sleep more easily by the night. They were talking about father, Bran realized. He wanted to know more, a few feet, but only would they would only see him if he swung in front of the window. We will have to watch him carefully, the woman said. I would sooner watch you, the man said. He sounded bored. Come back here. Lord Eddard has never taken an interest in anything that happens south of the neck, the woman said. Never, I tell you. He means to move against us. Why else would he leave the seat of his power? A hundred reasons. Duty, honor. He yearns to write his name large across the book of history, to get away from his wife or both. Perhaps he just wants to be warm for once in his life. His wife is Lady Aaron's sister. It's wonder Eliza was not here to greet us with her accusations. Bran looked down. There was a narrow ledge beneath the window, only a few inches wide. He tried to lower himself toward it. Too far. He would never reach. 
You fret too much. Lysa Aaron is frightened cow. That frightened cow shared John's Aaron's bed. If she knew anything, she would have gone to Robert before she fled King's Landing. When he had already agreed to foster the weakling son of hers at Castle Rock, I think not. She knew the boy's life would be hostage at her silence. She may grow bolder now that he's safe in the airy. Mothers, the man made the word sound like a curse. I think birthing does something to your mind. You're all mad, he laughed. It was a bitter sound. Let Lady Erin grow as bold as she likes. Whatever she knows, whatever she thinks, she knows. She has no proof. He paused a moment. Where does she? Do you think the king will require proof, the woman said? I tell you, he loves me not. And whose fault is that, sweet sister? Ben stood the ledge. He could drop down. It was too narrow to land on, but if he could catch hold of it and fell past, pull himself up, except that might make a noise, and draw them to the window. He was not sure what he was hearing, but he knew it was not meant for his ears. You are a blind as Robert, the woman was saying. If you mean I see the same thing, yes, the man said. I see a man who would sooner die than betray his king. He betrayed one already, or have you forgotten, the woman said. Oh, I don't deny his loyal to Robert. That's obvious. What happens when Robert dies and Joff takes the throne? And the sooner that comes to pass, the safer we'll all be. My husband grows more restless every day. Having Stark beside him will only make him worse. He's still in love with his sister, the insipid little dead sixteen-year-old. How long before he decides to put me aside for a, a new Liana? Bran was suddenly very frightened. He wanted nothing so much to go back the way he'd come, to find his brothers. Only what he would tell them. He had to get closer, Bran realized. He had to see who was talking. The man sighed. You should think less about the future and more about the pleasures at hand. Stop that, the woman said. Bran heard a sudden slap of flesh on flesh. The man's laughter. Bran pulled himself, climbed over the gargoyle, and crawled out onto the roof. This was a very easy way. He moved across the roof to the next gargoyle, right above the window of the room they were talking. All this talk is getting tiresome, sister, the man said. Come here and be quiet. Bran sat astride from the gargoyle, tightened his legs around, and swung himself around, upside down. He hung by his legs and slowly stretched his head down toward the window. The world looked strange upside down. A courtyard swam dizzily below him, its stones wet with melted snow. Bran looked in the window. Inside the room, a man and a woman were wrestling. They were both naked. Bran could not tell who they were. The man's back was to him, and his body screened the woman from view as he pushed her up against a wall. There were soft, wet sounds. Bran realized they were kissing. He watched wide-eyed and frightened, his breath tied in his throat. The man had a hand down between her legs, and he must have been hurting her there because the woman started to moan low in her throat. Stop it, she said. Stop it, stop it. Oh, please. But her voice was low and weak, and she did not push him away. Her hands buried themselves in her ha her hands buried themselves in his hair, his tangled golden hair, and pulled his face to her breast. Bran saw her face. Her eyes were closed and her mouth wide open, moaning. Her golden hair swung from side to side as her head moved back and forth, but still recognized the queen. He must have made a noise. Suddenly her eyes opened, and she was staring right at him. She screamed. Everything happened at once. The woman pushed the man wildly, shouting and pointing. Bran tried to pull himself up, bending double as he reached for the gargoyle. He was in too much of a hurry. His hands scraped uselessly across smooth stone, and in his panic his legs slipped. Suddenly he was falling. There was an instant of vertigo. A sickening lurch in the window flashed past. He shot out a hand and grabbed on the ledge, lost it, caught it again with his other hand. He swung against the building. Hard. The impact took the breath out of him. Bran dangled, one-handed, panting. Faces appeared in the window above him. The queen and now Bran recognized the man beside her. They looked as much alike as reflections in a mirror. He saw us, the woman said shrilly. So he did, the man said. Bran's fingers started to slip. He grabbed the ledge with his other hand. Fingernails dug unyielding stone. The man reached down. Take my hand, he said, before you fall. Bran seized his arm and held on tight with all his strength. The man yanked him up to the ledge. What are you doing? the woman demanded. The man ignored her. He was very strong. He stood Bran up on the sill. How old are you, boy? Seven, Bran said, shaking with relief. 
His fingers had dug deep gouges in the man's forearm. He let go sheepishly. The man looked over the woman. The things I do for love, he said, loathing. He gave Bran a shove. Screaming, Bran went backward out the window onto the empty air. There was nothing to grab onto. The courtyard rushed up to meet him. Somewhere off in the distance, a wolf was howling. Crows circled the broken tower, waiting for corn.